produced by the iLab at WBUR Boston. news our top story tonight in an emotional press conference this week bob dole announced that he was resigning from the u.s senate where he had served for nearly three decades hi there hi yes yes, yes. yes. Okay, thank you so up. much i'm going to look through one more time do you mind looking through with fresh oh, eyes we'll go, no, no, okay we'll go, okay go we're just going to do a sweep go ahead go ahead what you hear is norm mcdonald the former saturday night live star He's getting ready for a high-profile appearance on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon, though you wouldn't know it. Because at the moment, what's really consuming him is, where did he put his keys? I don't see it, man. Okay, I'm just made off CD. Okay. So it's September of 2016. Norm is going on Fallon to promote his comic novel. Some people have branded it a memoir, but it's really not. I mean, there's a character in it named Norm, and he used to be on Saturday Night Live, but most of it is fake. It took time to write, and it kept Norm off the circuit for a few years, which is why this is a perfect chance for him to reintroduce himself and also reinvent himself. Fallon also has Donald J. Trump on the show. Back then, he was just candidate Trump. Not a bad lead-in. Come on, we got to get out of here. She's got to get scream at us. Get get ready. Let's go. They're going to get mad at me. I'm starting to get there. Underneath my nostril. So this thing with the keys might seem strange to you, but for me, someone who's spent hours and hours with Norm over the last year, I'm used to this. Norm is always losing things and finding them. Because the Tonight Show is more important, right? Yeah. (laughs) Than your keys? (laughs) You bet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. And you know, tonight his keys aren't the only thing he's going to be looking for. I'm going to lose something. What do I need? Keys, phone, and wallet. Got it, got it, got it. I'm Jeff Edgers, and from WBUR Boston and the Washington Post, this is Edge of Fame, a show about the life that happens before, behind, and beyond the spotlight. This episode is a sneak peek of our plan to take over the podcast world, or something like that. We'll kick off the rest of the season February 15th. I'm the national arts reporter for the Washington Post, and it's my job to go all over the country looking for special stories and characters. So it's only natural that I'd be immersed in Norm MacDonald's world, because Norm is one of the great underappreciated geniuses in comedy and entertainment. I'm sorry to throw that word out there like it's just something to throw around, but he's special, and I feel like more people need to know about him. That's the why. The reason I'm embedded in Norm's life right now is because these two days are important. He wouldn't say that, but I think they're crucial as he tries to revitalize his career. And they'll also reveal why mainstream fame is always just beyond his grasp. So some history. Norm was born in Canada in 1959. He was a smart kid and apparently quite withdrawn, the middle of three brothers. Norm's father died when he was young. So after bumping around in Canada doing stand-up in the 80s, Norm came to the States. The first you hear of him would be on Star Search, where he appeared and lost. I finally quit smoking, you know. So I feel pretty good about that. I, uh, I smoked ever since I was a kid, so it was kind of tough for me, you know. I remember once I was eight years old, a little kid, behind my garage, sneaking a cigarette back there, and my dad caught me. He hauled me in. I thought I was in for the strap into my life, you know. What he did is he pulled out a big cigar. Must have been half the size of my arm, this giant cigar. Stuck it in my mouth, lit it up, made me smoke it. All the way through, right to the end. That's when I started smoking cigars real heavy. He spends some time off camera writing for The Dennis Miller Show and then jumping onto the staff of one of the all-time great sitcoms, Roseanne. Then some of his buddies, like Adam Sandler, David Spade, Chris Farley, they got him an audition and a meeting with SNL's grand poobah, Lorne Michaels. It's just a meeting because Norm doesn't really audition. So he goes to meet with Lorne Michaels, and instead of praising him and telling Lorne how great he is, He tells Lorne that he's the wrong guy for the job. He's got no impressions. He's just not good enough. Lorne seems to like this approach, and Norm's hired. We can 
Jim Buckley with Norm MacDonald. He becomes the anchor of the weekend update desk, or as he terms it decades before President Trump took office, the fake news. Thanks, I'm Norm MacDonald, and this is the fake news. <laughs> PLO leader Yasser Arafat announced this week that his wife is pregnant. The happy couple said they really don't care if the child is a boy or a girl, just as long as it hates Jews. <laughs> Norm was more than a joke reader. He did Weekend Update his way. You know, comics go on and they tell a joke and they, they know it's not a great joke or the joke doesn't land right. And they roll their eyes and they look apologetically to the audience and say, yeah, okay, I know that wasn't funny. Well, Norm never did that. Even if a joke truly did bomb, Norm believed. He would stare you down, stare right through that TV screen as if to tell you, I don't care whether you like this joke or not, it's mine. Jeffrey Dahmer's relatives are reportedly fighting over what to do with his body. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, some want to have sex with it while the rest want to put it in the fridge. So that's, uh... <laughs> Should have stopped at the premise that time. The, uh... On SNL, Norm was unyielding. He came across as down-to-earth, but he had high, almost unattainable standards. And a stubborn streak. Take one of his favorite subjects at the time. Just to remind you, this was the height of the O.J. Simpson murder trial. And Norm loved OJ jokes, just loved them. And now the fake news. Well, it is finally official. Murder is legal in the state of California. And so at a certain point, one of the TV executives, Don Olemeyer, who had been OJ's golf buddy, told Lauren he didn't want any more OJ jokes, or at least he didn't want so many. What did Norm do? Well, that covers the main developments in the OJ Simpson case this week. And after all, other important things are going on in the world. Now more O.J. Simpson. (laughs) Eventually, Norm was removed mid-season. Unheard of. He wasn't fired from Saturday Night Live, but he ended up leaving. And that's all the news. Thanks, folks. See you later. (laughs) But for me, Norm's leaving SNL was just the beginning. He starred in a movie called Dirty Work that didn't make a ton of money at the box office, but was still very funny. He starred in two different sitcoms, and he developed a weird sideline as one of the world's greatest late-night talk show guests. I mean, one time he went on Conan and told this moth joke. Seriously, you could boil this joke down to its essentials and tell it in 20 seconds. You probably know it. The moth goes to a doctor because he's depressed. A moth goes into a podiatrist's office, Mm -hmm. and uh, the podiatrist's office says, what's the problem? And the moth says, what's the problem? Where do I begin, man? He goes, I go to work for uh, Gregory Olinovich, and uh, all day long I work. (laughs) Honestly, Doc, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. I don't even know if Gregory Olinovich knows. He only knows that he has power over me. And that seems to bring him happiness. But I Norm turns this into like a seven, eight, nine-minute story that goes down all sorts of roads and dead ends and twists. He invokes Russian names that are almost impossible to pronounce. My other boy, Gregaro <laughs> Ivanilitovich. You know it's natural that he's doing this because he loves Russian literature. Not that you know it from his bits, but I'm telling you, this man reads Tolstoy religiously. Anyway, he tells this joke that just goes on and on and on. People basically realize, I don't know what's going on here, but it's special, and I want to be part of it. He says, Doc, sometimes I feel like a spider, even though I'm a moth, just barely hanging on to my web with an everlasting fire underneath me. I'm not feeling good. And so the, moss, the, the doctor says, Moth, man, you're troubled. But you should be seeing a psychiatrist. Why on earth did you come here? And then the moth said, because the light was on. So 
why isn't Norm on TV? Why isn't he enjoying the kind of mainstream success that his peers have enjoyed? You know, why is Rob Schneider getting a show and Adam Sandler getting billions of dollars to make movies? Norm isn't getting those same opportunities. I think in large part, it's because you can't describe exactly what he does. In a world of elevator pitches, Norm's unorthodox approach can be jarring, even unsettling. And brilliant. I'm not the only one who thinks this. Listen to what David Letterman told me. Uh, Norm is, uh, first and foremost, uh, smart, uh, uh, next funny, and uh, thirdly, most importantly perhaps, endlessly appealing. What, what's, why doesn't a guy like that get to, to have an hour every night? You know, he, there's no reason on this earth that that guy shouldn't have a regularly scheduled, easy-to-access uh, video outlet. So, show business is not a meritocracy, you know. Fame is, fame is the only currency, so... I always thought, you know, if I could just be the funniest stand-up, that would be enough. But it's not enough. <laughs> that sloshing sound, that's Norm shaving. He's getting ready for The Tonight Show, and we're talking about whether he feels underappreciated or not. If I was uh, 15 years old, and they told me, you know, how would you like when you're in your 50s to be taking a shave and being interviewed by a guy and go on, just about to go on The Tonight Show, I'd say, I'll take it. That would be fantastic. You know what I mean? And if the, and if the guy said, would you complain about anything? i go, well, of course I wouldn't. I, you know, I'd be in heaven, you know? So, uh, so uh, a number of years ago, I stopped comparing myself to people. I also used to want to have a magazine cover that said, the funniest man alive, you know. They do those every 10 years or so. I mean, you had had this moment of time for a whole bunch of reasons where you were starring in this big weekly television show, right. making movies, having sitcoms, uh -huh. basically being as big a star as you could be. And uh -huh. that's not necessarily all you're doing. Some of it is the outside world accepting you at that moment, right? Um, and you but that's also the, the appearance. Like, that's the perception. Like, the reality of my life... Um, well, I mean, if you really want to look at the reality of a person's life, it's basically uh, eating, you know, finding food. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, uh, of my career, that I always did stand-up, you know? I was lucky enough not to be a waiter or whatever these are. But at that moment, in 1997, I would argue, you weren't any funnier than you are now. You just happened no, to be was, more famous. I was less funny, but uh, yeah, I was more famous, yeah. We'll be back with more Norm in a minute. So the life Norm leads these days is pretty unglamorous, at least by Hollywood standards. He lives in a condo near the Los Angeles airport. He's divorced. He spends a lot of time alone. People sometimes will speculate that he's on drugs or drinking or something, but I've never seen him so much as drink a beer. He does take a pill for anxiety. The only vice I know about is gambling, and particularly sports gambling. He's lost his entire savings or fortune or whatever you want to call it a couple times already, but mostly he leads a pretty quiet life. He watches sports and news and tweets and he writes. I watched him work on his fake memoir, comic novel, whatever you want to call it, for months. And when it finally came out last year, he invited me to interview him on the stage in Washington, D.C. at the cultural center called Sixth and I. And when I showed up, the place was packed. This chapter you're going to read to us, it's called uh, uh, it's Tiny called, White Coffin, right? It's called Tiny White Coffin because yeah. uh, one time I saw a tiny white coffin and it struck me as, as one of the saddest uh, images I'd ever seen. So anyways, it's about a, a child 
When you're a celebrity of any sort, people want things from you, especially terminally ill children. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, there was a Make-A-Wish make uh, foundation and this child wanted me, he wanted to come to SNL. Natural. And, and then watch me um, throughout the week and see how uh, an idea became a sketch. So I said, okay, that, that's a wonderful idea. And uh, I uh, talked to him at his bedside and I, I got everybody else to scram, you know. And uh, I was saying how how touched I was that he, he uh, wanted to do that. And then he said, I don't want to do that. I just made that up. I haven't uh, liked uh, SNL since Bill Murray left. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, what, what, what's, what do you want me for? He said, well, do you have your Canadian citizenship still? And I said, yes, I'm Canadian, you know? And uh, he said, well, that helps my wish. My wish is to kill a baby seal. <laughs> so we took him, you know, me and my buddy. <laughs> so clearly this isn't true. I don't believe that Norm took a young child out into the wilds to kill a baby seal, but it got a good laugh. But there was another section of the book that I really wanted him to read. To me, it's... It's maybe the most honest and true section you can find. It's about him staring in the mirror and his view of himself. I mean, this part really choked me up when I first read it. When people come to see me do stand-up, it is because somewhere in their memory, I live on SNL, dressed as a young Burt Reynolds, insisting Alex Trebek refer to me as Turt Ferguson. <laughs> and they come to see me, and I am old and fat, and I don't mention SNL, and I do my answering machine joke that always does well. And they are happily disappointed, and after the show, they stand beside me and take pictures, the way you would with a donkey at the side of a road. <laughs> they tell me they are big fans, and they don't care what their girlfriends say. <laughs> They understand me, even though they know good and well that no one else does. I'm dry, they say. The next time I come to their town, they do not show up. It can be difficult to define yourself by something that happened so long ago and is gone forever. It's like a fellow at the end of the bar telling no one in particular about the silver medal he won in high school track, the one he still wears around his neck. The only thing an old man can tell a young man is that it goes fast, real fast. And if you're not careful, it's too late. Of course, the young man will never understand this truth. So the book comes out and it seems to accomplish what I'd think he'd want. It makes a bestseller list, it's excerpted in The New Yorker. Norm is out and about. Which brings us back to The Tonight Show. From Studio 6B in Rockefeller Center in the heart of New York City, it's The Tonight Show starring Jimmy Fallon. Hey, 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 hey. I called up Norm a couple of days before his appearance because I wanted to interview him a little bit on the phone before he went on. Instead, he says, oh, why don't you just come? So I did. I got on the train and headed to New York. Met Norm for lunch and had my recorder with me. So this is the floor, huh? What this floor is, is the this? Floor. This is the sixth floor. Yeah? Tonight show. Floor. Yeah, where Johnny Carson started. When we arrived at Rockefeller Center, we headed straight into Steve Higgins' office. Higgins and Norm have a long history. Higgins has been a writer for Saturday Night Live for years. He's also Jimmy Fallon's sidekick. And hearing Higgins, you know you could tell that he's glad to see Norm's out of the house. Well, well, well. Look who it is. This guy here. Come back from the dead. Don't we know this room? Hi, How are you? So I get in there and it's kind of amazing. Remember how earlier I said Donald Trump was a guest on the same show? Well, the hallways are full of Secret Service. Tonight, the big news is that Fallon will muss Trump's hair 
and then get attacked for not interrogating the then candidate for his combative attacks on Hillary Clinton, immigrants, and well, you know how that story ends. But that's later. For now, I'm standing there with the recorder over my chest when Jimmy Fallon walks in. Uh, how great, by the way, is your book? Based, right. based on a true story. Oh, it's great. Yeah, yeah, the best title. When he approaches Norm, it feels more like he's just a big fan, like a young kid on Saturday Night Live looking up to one of his idols. Do you remember, do you remember like, the first time I actually uh, met you, met you? Because I met you like through Sandler or something. Like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the biggest fan. But you were at Bel Air Hotel me having breakfast with Bob Newhart. Oh, yeah. And you were sitting yeah. with Bob Newhart, and I went over to your table, and I go, oh, my God, just sorry to interrupt, but Norm McDonald, you're like one of my idols. You're my favorite comedians. You're the best. Yeah, you saw Bob Newhart. Yeah, you go, hey, what do you say? It's Bob, it's Bob Newhart. What are you talking about? You, you say, it's Bob Newhart. Like, I was like, oh, yeah, no, you're great. Of course, you're great, too, Bob Newhart. But Damn, I never thanks for the that. bit tonight. That's going to be Oh, it'll great. be fun, right? Oh, I'm yeah, so excited. Yeah, I think it'll be fun. Because he's doing this whole thing where he's going to bring uh, no, really his, 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 I know. his health I know. records. Yeah. It's such a good bit. It's going to be great. And uh, I don't know the joke, so I'm just going to read it off the paper. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, you're, you're more over the, overdue. You're more than always welcome oh, on the show. We love you, man. Thank you and so Fred much, Stoller. So much Thanks, Fred. Before I tell you what happens next, there's something you should know about Norm. Sometimes he has problems with basic sorts of tasks. Like you go to buzz in at his door at his condo and it's sort of like a comedy of errors. He keeps pressing the button at the wrong time or doesn't know exactly what number for you to call. His mom, who still lives in Canada, would tell me that when he was on SNL, you know, making a lot of money, she would call up his apartment and sometimes wouldn't be able to get through because the phone had been disconnected. Norm just forgot to pay the bill. And in this case, Norm maybe needs someone to hold his jokes. Because when he gets to The Tonight Show, he can't find him. The sheet of paper is missing. Where am I? I just want you to lose it. I just use a dialogue. I don't know. I just had it. You just have it. It became more of a thing than I thought it was. This, what the fuck? It's in, it's in the book, I bet. But what I've learned with Norm is not to worry. Just let it be. Be the ball, right? And so he goes on The Tonight Show without his jokes. And somehow, they emerge. I don't know if it's spontaneity or that he just remembers them, but he makes it work. Ah, I saw, you know, Mr. Trump is here and he's on Dr. Oz and he released his medical records. <laughs> so I decided, as... You know, uh, entertainer in chief. <laughs> I decided that I would release my. I think the American people. Oh my goodness! Deserve to Absolutely, know. Absolutely, yes. Now, you don't have to do this, Norm. I know, but I, I feel that uh, it's uh, it's my duty. Now, I will say I, I'm a little nervous because I have not looked at this. My my doctor gave it to me directly before the show. And it's a sealed envelope. It's a sealed I can attest oh. that Mr. McDonald's blood pressure is an astonishingly excellent 120 over 80. Hey, fantastic. That's great. That's good. Mr. McDonald has the physical endurance of 10 men half his age. Whoa, my goodness. This is unbelievable. Mr. McDonald's spleen is, I, I want to say, good. <laughs> Your spleen is, okay. It was successful. Everything went well. But now Norm is trying to hustle to the airport when he realizes he's misplaced his wallet. Several people are crouched on the sidewalk looking for it. His producing partner, Lori Joe Hoekstra, his comedian friend, Fred Stoller, and finally, success. Lori Joe finds Norm's wallet. Everything's okay now, right? All good. Good to go. I'll see you next week, okay? Uh, See you next week, pal. Good job. So Norm found his wallet that night. I think he also started the process of rediscovering his audience. Netflix signs him on to do a comedy special, something he hasn't done in years. And there's talk of adapting his novel into a television show. And so I go to see Norm months later to just kind of put a bow around this story. You know, to let him reflect on how much he's grown and how much things have changed. And what do I find? You're checking the score. Come on. Well, it's 40 now. Yeah, but this is a, this is a big night. What was it? 114. 
It means it has to get to 57 uh, the quarter. And the Lakers are winning. Yeah. So we're backstage at a comedy club, and Norm's about to go on. And he's become obsessed with a couple of completely insignificant basketball games. You guessed it, he's been gambling again. The night before, he tells me he bet on a tennis match at the Australian Open between two players he's never heard of. He's definitely in some sort of weird spiral, but he tells me it's not quite as bad as before. As I watch this unfold backstage, all I can think is, he's going to bomb. And just as things were starting to go his way again. Of course, he goes out there, and what happens? He kills. You see the inauguration today? And all the pundits, you know, they were like, this was the worst speech ever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'll listen to that. I like the worst things ever. So after the show, I head back to his hotel room, and I spend more time badgering him. What I want is for him to resolve his own story, to tell me what this last year has meant, how he was in, you know, some kind of seclusion and he's reemerged, to tell me how it feels, and I can't get him to say anything. I mean, if you have a satisfying ending, I don't know what comes before. You taped a million hours. Yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what would wrap it up. Let me think for a moment. At 2.30 in the morning, I've got to go. And I realize, what was I hoping to get? Isn't this perfect in a way? This isn't the Hallmark movie of the week. For Norm, every story is the anti-story. Wouldn't it be wrong for Norm to wrap up his own story neatly in a bow? Instead, he's just going to stare you down, see if you'll laugh. And if you don't laugh, well, that's on you. Edge of Fame is a production of the Washington Post and WBUR, Boston's NPR station. This episode was produced by Adam Ragusea and edited by Jessica Alpert and Iris Adler. Our production assistant is Cameron Chertavian, original music by Adam Ragusea, and sound design by John Parati. Our executive producers are Jessica Alpert, Jessica Stahl, and me. For more information about today's show and other episodes of Edge of Fame, go to WashingtonPost.com slash Edger's podcast. If you want to tell me what you think of this story, you can find me on Twitter at Jeff Edgers, and that's Jeff spelled G-E-O-F-F. We'll drop our first episode of the season in a few weeks, so make sure you subscribe to Edge of Fame on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.